Are you feeling terrible? Is that is that friend that you just can't stand called depression knocking on your door once again? Well, you heard that's like a yeah, it's like one of those old um, you know, what do they call them? The, the public access like messages. <laughs> yeah, the more she's you like, know, to a dark cloud like. <laughs> not to make not to make light of it because depression sucks big it time suck. and that's yeah. why we have this special episode on depression because Ooh. hey the winter blues are among us this is the existential soak podcast i'm randy that's danny what's going on danny what's up randy there's also like i mean like a million other reasons that people could be depressed too oh yeah life <laughs> hello in general yeah yeah it's, it's harder it's, now it's, than i i i mean i'm sure we, people have said this throughout history Oh, but I'm pretty been. sure that emotionally and existentially, in our life case... has never been harder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't want to no, blame I... it on the 1980s. But... <laughs> but yeah. No, I think you're actually right, though. I mean, I do. Because I think, like, well, one, we're, we face more information than we ever had to process. We're aware of what's going on in the world way more on a daily basis than we've ever been. And, like, there's, you know, the news, social media, all that stuff feeds on emotion that's what keeps you watching so the more negative the more depressing the more dark things are the more people are going to tune in and so you get this over emphasis on all the bad things constantly right and like instead of like really because the good things they don't sell so Mm -hmm. it's like you know part of the problem yeah and depression can be frightening too because i mean end game of depression is suicide you know (laughs) oftentimes like depression comes about this feeling of hopelessness Things aren't going to get any better. And it's crazy because yeah. it's, it's the it's the world's oldest con. It's your mind playing a trick on you because during those times when you're down, things look differently from your mind. They they did studies with depressed individuals and bipolar individuals and undepressed individuals. And people just couldn't make sense of like normal rhymes, like a bird in the hand is worth two in a bush. People who had like bipolar and were depressed couldn't understand yeah. this type of stuff, whereas somebody else would be like, oh, yeah, I get what that means. It's just yeah. your mind well, doesn't function you're... normally at those times. No, and I feel like I know, especially like myself, like I feel like my like you feel like it's hard to concentrate. You'll get scattered brain, right? Like I know, like I'll have a really like it almost feels like my brain's slow, you know, like or slower, mm-hmm. slowed down. Yeah, it's really weird and it's frustrating, which then makes it worse, which then a key. And I, I think that's the, the difficult thing with it, too. And I know this. I'm sure this happens to you, too, because I know we talked about it a lot, but like it's like this like snowball effect. Of like the negativity, the hopelessness feeds more negative negative interpretations and hopeless interpretations, which feed the negativity and hopelessness. Mm-hmm. And it's just like this intense cycle, right? Yeah. And and here's the other thing is that you need to talk to somebody about it. So like like I was saying, with depression, like as it gets worse, it leads to suicidal, homicidal, different types of thoughts. And other people can't read your mind, unfortunately. No, be even nice. even, well, even re- no even really good therapists are terrible at predicting when their patients oh, yeah. are suicidal or anything like that. So like if you do have thoughts like that, talk to somebody. There's no harm in it. Like one time when I was feeling suicidal, I talked to Danny and he helped me out of it, just helping yeah. me recognize that like people have these thoughts and it's okay. Yeah. And it happens I, to all of us. It really does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it does happen to all of us. And I think that's what you forget too, because it's easy to like, and whenever we, and I think whenever we have problems, especially whether it's depression or whether it's just like a, a difficult obstacle in life, because it's our own, it always feels unique, individual, and like no one else would ever have it before. But the reality is you talk to other people and you realize, oh, every, it's part of the human experience. Everybody's been through this. Maybe not the exact same thing, maybe not for the exact same reasons, but the, you know, general outlines, very similar, they'll understand. And I think your point, too, that other people can't read your mind is a really good one, because I think we tend to like I know, like, just in general, most people tend to kind of err on the side of like people are doing okay. So even if they see somebody's like not doing well, they're like, well, I don't want to bother them. Like, I don't want to make it worse. Right. Or I don't want to point it out just in case, like, you know, for whatever reason, like we actually talk ourselves out of it. So a lot of times that's hard because it makes the it means the person that is depressed needs to make the effort to talk to someone. I mean, hopefully if somebody around you that actually will notice it and say something, but like, you know, don't be shy to talk because I think it's not people being mean. They're just like doing what we normally do, right? Which is trying to kind of not bother each other, you know, if we're having a bad day or something. Yeah. So uh, I've been really fortunate recently. I stumbled upon this author who is a medical doctor, but also a psychologist. And he wrote some amazing books dealing with anxiety and depression. You don't say. 
Which the, book? I, I, yeah, the most recent one is called Feeling Great. But another one that I really like is called When Panic Attacks. He has a whole bunch of books. He even has a free podcast called The Feeling Good Podcast. It's very good. And it's crazy because what he talks about a lot is how it's these cognitive distortions. So basically these faulty ways of thinking yeah. that lead to a lot of problems with anxiety and depression. And particularly with depression, one of the big ones is all or nothing thinking and perfectionism. So like oh, the yeah. idea that because I have this one flaw, that means that I'm a flawed human being. It's never going to get any better. And I feel bad, which is emotional reasoning. So it's over. I remember, I remember I was really depressed too. Like at points you always, it's, you tend to, I know at least, well, you tend to focus on one thing. A lot of times it doesn't have to be the same thing every day, but there'll be like one thing that seems like insurmountable. I remember my student loans used to always give me that feeling, right? Where like, it'd be like, just like, thing that's like how am i ever going to get rid of that like oh is, is it even makes sense to keep going like it's so you know what i mean like because and the logic does yeah. make sense at the time you know in your head it makes sense there's a lot of emotions involved it's easy to convince ourselves right and to see the world that way and i think it's interesting because we do tend to do that we'll focus on like one big thing that's like this this seemingly impossible obstacle ahead of us and it's funny because i noticed like once you start dealing with these things that you realize how easy it is to start dealing with them and it's like, it's just like, you're. it's weird. You're like dragging your feet almost to make the effort. Yeah. Yeah. And it's crazy because you're, you know, you know how we always used to talk about this, how like we would ask each other, like, or it was something along the lines of like, when you're feeling bad, you think your life is terrible. But when you think yeah. when you're feeling good, you think your life is great. And it's crazy how the mind plays tricks on you, because when you're in a bad spot, the thoughts are like, oh, it's terrible. It's never going to get any better. And then when you're in a good spot. You don't even think about it. You're just like, life is awesome. I'm never going to have any worries ever again. I've finally solved everything. Yeah. <laughs> finally free. Yeah. yeah. It'll be like this for, well, that's the funny thing. We make really big mistakes that things are static, that they'll stay the same forever, which is a terrible mistake that we make because that's, you know, when the good feelings are there, we think they'll last forever. When the bad feelings are there, we think they'll last forever. Like nothing is going to change, even though change a constant. Right. And I think it's funny too, because we also like, it's so easy to forget that the world we see is an interpretation heavily influenced by our emotional state, our physical state. And it's not just about our beliefs and ideas. And I think when you start to remember, or when you consciously remember that, it can help you be more aware too. Like I noticed the more I started, cause I, I started to try to like be more um, aware of my like emotions and identify them. And it's been an ongoing process, but I noticed the more I do that, the more I am able to catch times where I'm like, Oh, everything's messed up. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. Uh, no, I'm just tired or like I'm just feeling a little down today or whatever. That's really the reason, not that everything is actually bad. Yeah. And and also like uh, you know, depression, it may it may be a disease. You know, like it may be. There may oh, be sure. some there's, biological there's parts. Probably, yeah. You know, hmm. but it can also be a symptom, like a sign that something else is going on. Uh a lot of people have have postulated that depression is like an unconscious psychological conflict and i knew that when i was the most depressed in my life it was because there was an unconscious psychological conflict i was supposed to get married to this girl that i really didn't want to get married to and the closer it got to the wedding the more and more depressed i got until i spoke with my brother and he said you know you can marry her or you cannot marry her either way i'll love you and i was just like yeah. holy cow you mean i don't have to do this and he's like no and well, so and that's that, the, other... and the depression lifted immediately. Well, that's one of the worst things I think that does. And it really does feel like a weight lifted off your shoulders, doesn't it? It's like crazy how much pressure it feels like you're under, like underwater almost. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, too, because in those situations, right, we let these perceived obligations and expectations from the outside confine us to a position where we have no choice. And I know like that's for a lot of people, I think that's when they feel the most hopeless. It's like you feel like you can't act because this obligation says you should do X or these people expect you to do X, Y, Z or be this thing or whatever. And you yeah. feel pigeonholed. And I think that's where we find that hopelessness most because it's like, you know, it's kind of like that feeling of like, you know, you're doing the wrong thing, but you don't know how to do the right thing or how to make room for yourself to do it. Yeah. And, and you're in pain, whether it be physical or psychological or emotional. And it doesn't look like there's a way out. And the only better option seems like, okay, suicide. But it, yeah, in 99% of the cases, that may not be the right answer. 
I mean, generally, I think it's probably not because it is like the, the problem with that is it is a final answer, right? Like you don't get any more chances or answers. Mm -hmm. after the, the only that. way you can guarantee <laughs> that things won't change, that yeah, they won't right. get better is by suicide. Yeah, Absolutely. it's crazy. And I think it's uh, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Do you yeah, have something but, else? <laughs> well, yeah, because I mean, I think there are also like philosophers who have talked about suicide and how it is the last right that you have in some countries. They allow like assisted suicide and things like that, but no, it's not something where that. you can do immediately. Like, what do you think? Because you used to teach some of this stuff. What do you think would happen mm -hmm. if there was a depressed person who wanted to commit suicide? Do you well, think that they funny. would just be like, okay, well, let's just process this stuff and you can go ahead and do it? Or do you think there would be kind of a time gap? And maybe some. There's always a time between. gap and there's yeah. always, there's always a time gap and there's always a requirement that like you have to see multiple people. And the Netherlands is actually a great use case for this because they've had it for a long time, like active euthanasia. And they actually have like some of the best end of life care because that's an option. So I think it actually, I think studies have found from what I remember that having that choice of like, because you know, like in America, like you get a disease or something, you don't feel good. And it's like, you have to fight it or nothing. Those mm -hmm. are your options, right? Like you're well, a failure, it's, it's you give up. Like, or in you in keep America, fighting. it's really bad because it's like, you either have to fight it or you're a coward and you can die. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or you're like, you're, you're doing something bad to all these other people that are alive. Mm -hmm. Like it makes no sense. It's insane. Over there, though, it gives the patient more autonomy, right? Because it's like, oh, I can pursue treatment or this is an actual option where you'll assist me in this and it'll be peaceful. Mm -hmm. And so but there is like to your point, right? There is a process like you have to show that there is a problem. They don't just do it for everybody. And, you know, people were always scared of that, like snowball effect. Like if we just allow it, everybody's going to blah, you know, it's, just and it's like slippery slope before you know yeah. it, there'll be nobody left. And it's it's pretty clear that it's not that hard to put in, you know, reasonable regulations yeah, but and also not everybody wants to commit suicide some people enjoy their lives yeah. you know? but there's also good arguments too that like you know especially like you know i can clearly imagine cases that where somebody depressed or you know and like that might be an option that's reasonable but at least if it's on the table it becomes a choice and that hopelessness feels less it, it feels like you have options and that might even motivate you to then look at other options because when that choice is there, it makes it easier to think about other things as well. And it's something where you have to talk to other people. Like, I think talking with other people about yeah. it is one of the most <clears throat> important things to do. I know there's like a big fear about talking with other people because, oh, no, what happens if they make me go to the hospital or something like that? And it's like, that would probably be the best thing for you at that point if that happens. But if it's that bad. Yeah. I mean, it, sometimes that is the right thing. But yeah. like talking to other people is so important because when you're stuck talking with yourself in your head, you're, number one, your mind's not in the right place anyway, so you're talking with a really bad person to talk with in your head. But also, like I was saying, people can't read your minds. And Danny and I both knew people who commit suicide when we were younger. I had two oh, yeah. friends who did it when I was younger, and they didn't tell anybody buddy, before they did it. I had a friend and, in grad school who did it, yeah, and, like, yeah, and nobody and, knew. And everybody who uh, met at their funeral was like, man, I wish he wouldn't have done that. Like, I love this guy. And so it's... Yeah, it sucks, too, because, you know, you don't... Like, you know, I know my friend, too, that this happened this happened later and like, no, I'm in a younger, but like, you know, you don't know why either. And that's always a hard part, you know, because it's like if they just said something and then you feel bad and it's like, you know, a whole mess. But yeah, mm -hmm. it is because, you know, nobody wants the other person to go. And, you know, yeah. it's tough. Dealing this, with is, it. this is actually so this is a crazy thing. In one of these books by David Burns, he was talking about uh, how he was having a conversation with someone who was uh, suicidal. And one of the thoughts that they were having at that time was it would be it would be better off for my friends and my family if I just commit suicide. And he's like, okay, let's take a look at that thought. Let's examine the evidence. Have you ever asked your friends or family if you're a burden on them, if they would feel better yeah. if you were suicidal? And they said no. And he's like, well, why don't you go just ask, see what they think? Because maybe maybe you're right. You know, it could be true. You may be a bigger burden. But there's a good chance that you wouldn't. And they went around and they asked their friends and family and they were like, no, I'd be devastated. Like, I know this person whose brother or sister yeah. did it and they've never been the same since. And if you did that to me, like, sure, you're a pain, but I still would prefer <laughs> to have you alive. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's funny, too, I think, too, because like if you talking about things to putting them out in the world changes them, too, because it takes it out of your head and it helps with like not letting your imagination run wild with the ideas. Even if like, even if you're afraid to talk to somebody, just writing these things down can be helpful too. It's like a good starting point, I think, to get to talking. Like sometimes, you know, like you want to talk to people, but you're not clear, like getting sit down and just write down, like what is bothering me? Trying to trace back that why, ask that why over and over again. 
get some clarity and then talk to somebody. But even just getting it on paper helps. That's a really good one. You remember when we did the artist's way book and we Yeah. and yeah. they made you yeah. like write for I don't know what was it seven pages Felt every like day forever, or something like but that. it was a <laughs> yeah. Yes. But actually it's it's crazy cuz I've been doing that a lot recently where before I go to sleep I'll take a blank sheet of paper and I'll just write a whole bunch of like I feel statements like I feel this way I feel this way and just like rant for both sides of it and then rip it out. And it's crazy because it just gets all that stuff out of my head. off my chest and then i can just go to sleep a whole bunch lighter it's a great practice Yeah. You know, it's funny, you know, how like in, in meditation and they always say like, you know, you want to like, you don't want to cling to your thoughts. You want to like, you want to recognize them, but let them go. Right. And like detach from them. And they had this, uh, it was in Buddhism. I think that some, I forget who, but they refer to it as like untying psychic knots. Like you're untying all the knots in your brain, which I always like that phrasing. And, It's funny when you write things down like that and stuff, it is, there is like a letting go. It's like, if you keep it in your head, you never voice it, you never write it down. It just keeps getting spun around and made bigger and bigger and bigger. If you get it out, it's like, it allows you to let go of it a bit. And I think it also can help too. Cause I noticed like when I do that myself, then I start writing stuff down. A lot of times it also helps me start planning how to deal with it too. Cause it makes it like more real, like, Oh, this is the problem right here. It's not my imagination keeps adding things on or adding, you know, context and things and situations. It's like, now I can probably address it. So it is a very helpful method. I think it does let you kind of detach from it a bit. Mm -hmm. yeah and let's see anything else for depression it so like it's happened to me it's happened to danny it's happened Yeah. to a lot of other people Everybody. too I'm pretty yeah sure like so probably everybody so <laughs> at even some though point. even though you are special you're not unique in that depression has only hit you but when you are depressed it can feel like it's unique to you and there's something specifically wrong with you and it's never going to get any better but that's just a feeling and that doesn't mean it's true Exactly. And the other thing, too, is I think when you if you are like pay attention and this is also difficult, but if you are like be you're doing what you're interacting with, because I know like a lot of times when people are depressed, they'll actually like seek out things online that are going to make aggravate the depression. So like say you're broke, right? You start looking at houses that are $10 million or $500 million. You know what I mean? Like that kind of activity or looking at like Facebook of people's lives from vacation pictures and stuff. And you're like, well, I don't have that. So just shutting that stuff off. And taking a break from it is probably one of the best things you can do too, because you will seek out whatever is going to aggravate that depression and make it worse. Cause that's, what's going to draw your attention the most. Mm -hmm. that's a great point yeah how am i contributing to my own suffering Well, exactly. Right. And we do it because we also want to, that's the other, that's the other like kind of like uh con part of it and trick, which is like our brain wants to justify and reinforce how we feel with reasons. And it's very easy to seek reasons out. Right. It's like when you write like a really bad paper in college that's totally biased where you just find what supports your argument, right? And don't look at anything else. It's basically what you're doing, right? And it's easy to do because, you know, we want to justify that how we're feeling is valid and real. And so we're going to make it the case. Mm -hmm. yeah and uh so yeah le the only recommendation that i would have is uh you know there's books by david burns and just small steps in the right direction because it doesn't take much but like when you're depressed it can be the hardest thing to get out of bed it can be the hardest thing to take a Dude, shower to smile my thing, that to was do my anything thing was just like, when I finally committed, I was like, all right, can't do this anymore. I was like, I started making like plans for like the next day. I was like, I'm just going to shower. And that was the only goal I had for the day. So it was like awesome because one, it was easy to do. Well, I mean, not easy, but you know what I mean? Like it's a, you can have plenty of time to do it, but it's also, it's also, a, you know, a win. It's also, you know, and it shows you that you can do these things and start making those changes. And then it's like a snowball effect. Mm -hmm. Things Yeah, just and get better and better. like I've always been a fan of the calendar method where you just have a calendar and you just put an X on the day when you do the thing you're supposed to do. So like in the beginning, it's going to be hard to do anything. So pick one positive habit, you know, be it like drink a drink a whole bunch of water or go for a walk or say Yeah. hi Right for to an two minutes. animal, write for Yeah. two minutes, whatever it is, like pick one habit that could make a positive impact in your life. And then just start putting X's on the calendar and connect them. And if you miss a day, so be it. Don't let it be two days in a row. And that Yeah. can really be helpful in getting you someplace where you'd like to That be. does help a lot. Yeah. And talk to people. I mean, I think Mm that's hmm. the main thing, too. Bingo. Yeah, get it out there. So there you have it on depression. Uh, hopefully, if you're feeling depressed, uh, you can feel better because, hey, you know, it's the world's oldest con. And unfortunately, 
-hmm. our brains are smarter than we are sometimes so we gotta yeah there's also there's also that there's also that three digit number now too isn't there what is it i don't know the actual nine 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 no that's uh nine one one yeah, that's the emergency. It's like three eight eight or nine eight or something for depression. I don't know. I don't want to confuse yeah, they you. Yeah, they should have. They should have advertised it better. But yeah, this is the suicide prevention hotline, depression number, a whole bunch yeah. of stuff. Tons of resources online. No joke about the Feeling Good podcast and the books by David Burns, Feeling Great When Panic Attacks. Those things have oh, they've been changed my life. Hell yeah, and they're good Incredible. books. I've read some of them already, and they're yeah. good. Yeah, incredible. They're very good. Yeah. So actually, they've they've been proven scientifically to be to work better than antidepressants for depression. you don't hear that often from books right yeah go <laughs> figure yeah so that's all for that's this awesome. episode of the existential Soul podcast join us next time until then i'm randy that's danny i'll see you later danny later randy